and Happy New Year. I'm Glenna Milberg. Grateful we are starting out the year together. 2022 had its challenges. Today, we thought we would look ahead. Priorities, progress, and predictions for the new year. And to that end, every county mayor in South Florida, all three, are here. To launch this week in South Florida 2023, we have all the South Florida county mayors here. And we usually talk about the big news of the week, but today, let's have a big conversation about where we all are and where we are all going. Welcome to Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava, Broward Mayor Lamar Fisher, and Monroe County Mayor Craig Cates. So good to have everybody together. Thank you. Thank you for having us. With you, Glenna, always. Always. So um, let's start out with, uh, we've predetermined we're going by county population to start the show. So uh, <laughs> I want to get a sense of, you know, we, we're all listening. Everyone here listening today, you represent. That's what I love about this program today. Let's get a sense of just, is there, of all of the big issues that we all face in South Florida every day, is there one particular thing that jumps out as we start 2023 that is the priority? Daniela Levine Cava, what's up in Miami-Dade? It's got to be affordability, Glenna. We are really the beneficiary of huge economic recovery and growth and extraordinary demand for our housing. And with limited space, we are unfortunately making it increasingly difficult for our working families to be able to afford to stay here, uh, live here, work here. And so we've been working aggressively and going into 2023, a lot of our programs will be coming to fruition to provide relief to strapped renters and homeowners. Definitely on the list to talk about in the next uh, 20, 30 minutes or so. Lamar Fisher um, in Broward, I'm guessing such similar things. What's the priority? It is housing affordability, as the mayor had mentioned, um, and how we're going to continue to provide the opportunities for our families to be able to live in Broward County and actually all counties here in South Florida. So it's a challenge. Uh, we have a, a housing trust fund that we have developed. We were able this year to put in about almost $60 million in that trust fund to be able to uh, provide some funding availability to those developers and also to be able to increase some density in certain areas uh, that will provide housing for our folks. But without a doubt, it is absolutely the number one priority. I, I'm going to guess that, you know, nationwide, we're going to hear all of that. And interesting that in South Florida, we face, again, so many common problems. The Keys, Monroe County, it, it's kind of, you know, the rules are sometimes different there. A lot of things are just different just to the county below. But Mayor Craig Cates, um, affordability, housing, that's always been an issue in, in the Keys. And what is the priority? Priority right now? Well, that would be our number one priority. Uh, it's affordable housing, affordable living, as one mayor stated. And uh, sea level rise goes right along with our affordable housing because we can't build our way out of this uh, in the Keys because we don't have more uh, land to build on. So we only have a few hundreds, I think 700 uh, Rogo units left to even build in Monroe County. So we have to look at it a little bit different and come up with creative uh, thinking out of the box ways to address our issues. So, you know, now that we have a trifecta, let, let's start really digging into, you know, affordable housing is the title and the buzzword and the quote unquote, but that encompasses so much because affordable housing means rents that people can pay. It means rising costs of living in the house you already have and the recently passed property insurance laws uh, are, are not going to really make a dent in that problem for at least a year or two, as we hear. And, and it means people buying their first home and starting the ability to make investments. So please don't wait for Q&A because I think, you know, with the brain trust we have here, I'd love to hear you discuss. Um, Daniela, since you brought it up, and I hope you don't mind first name basis, that's how we roll here. Um, it, it, the uh, affordable housing in Miami-Dade literally does not exist for many people. And I know there are so many uh, programs going on. It, is that enough to really right. fill the need? No, what we're doing is aggressive and bold, unprecedented, historic, but it's not enough. So we've got here uh, one, uh, we are the most unaffordable place in the country. So along with being the most recovered economy, uh, the, the biggest gap uh, for those paying more than 
what's recommended, a third of their salary, more than 50% of their salary, the most housing burdened and extremely housing burdened place in the country. So really, we can't uh, build fast enough our way out of this. We have to densify, we have to subsidize, we have to incentivize, and we're doing all of that in partnership with the private sector. This year's $10 billion budget in Miami-Dade includes a whopping half a billion for housing. It's really unprecedented. And in that are many new programs. We invested uh, 80 million new dollars in something called HOMES, which includes helping homes stay affordable. So maybe they're needing renovations. We don't want the owners to be incentivized to flip them and uh, re redevelop. So we want to give them money, actually grants to um, uh, shore up roofs, windows, et cetera, and keep the housing affordable. That's one aspect. Another, we're actually subsidizing landlords to bring prices within reach for the middle class, working class, all the way up to 140% of area median income. So you know, I, I want to, you brought up landlords. I, I want to talk about a, a story that we recently covered um, about one building, and I, I do know of others, we just haven't covered them yet, where landlords and owners find themselves with an old building in a really hot neighborhood and have summarily <clears throat> ended leases for people under the guise of being an unsafe building. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's a component of affordable housing that we're really not talking about. I, have you had that, um, Lamar, Craig, Daniela, have you had that problem where people are being kicked out of what is their affordable home by, I don't want to use the word greedy because I don't want to sign intent, but what appears to be greedy landlords? We do have dollars specifically, and we have done aggressive outreach. We can't force a landlord to take our money and maintain affordability, but we do have landlords who are ready to accept dollars to fix up, patch up, and they'll continue to make money, make a profit, but they won't be making any, the profit that they would make if they uh, leveled and started from scratch. Lamar, Craig, are you hearing the same? Are you experiencing the same? We are uh, in Broward County, um, and even going a step back a little bit further, uh, we have landlords that are available to, to us to have the rapid housing opportunities for those who actually are experiencing homeless that so we can get them off the street into the rapid housing. Uh, and we're lucky to have those landlords, but we don't have enough of them. And unfortunately, uh, you know, market rate rentals today are taking precedence with, uh, with the private sector. So how do we incentivize them? How do we give them dollars? when they create new projects, again, through the trust fund, but more importantly, providing the opportunity for the municipalities to participate to create, again, more opportunities for more density to at least have that project 10 or 15% affordable and, and have a truly mixed use, retail, market rate, and affordability. So we're trying to be creative in every way we can, but the numbers are just tough to reach at this particular time. I think our medium household uh, at this point sales 560, 575, and it's totally just unaffordable for, for young families uh, and see how much money you're gonna have to actually make to even make that make that mortgage payment is just outrageous. And, and this is happening in a nationwide cool down in the housing market. So South Florida really has, you know, there's two sides to the coin for South Florida not being in a housing cool down at the moment. Craig and Monroe, you brought us something really interesting in that sea level rise is such a component of a lot of things, but, but certainly of being able to live on an island chain. What are you experiencing? Well, we're experiencing, you know, affordable housing issues just like everybody else, but the sea level rise is, is taking away a lot of the properties that would possibly be built on. And then a lot of the houses that are, are low, uh, which have to be replaced or can't get flood insurance now, are the affordable units. So a lot of these poor condition places, as the other mayors have talked about, are kind of de facto affordable housing because they're in bad condition when the the property owner tries to improve it, his costs go way up and he has to raise the price. Yeah, insurance is high, building in the Keys, you got to, and Miami, and uh, you have to build for 180 mile an hour winds and elevate them. It's, it's very expensive to build like that. So uh, it's, we got to think outside the box, hopefully maybe downstairs enclosures, we could uh, bring them, some of them back, waterproof them, 
uh, limit the size of them, but we gotta, we need to think of a way to, so we will not have an economy in the lower keys uh, because we need the workers. We bring in about a thousand workers a day from Miami and Homestead to the upper keys working with Miami-Dade with the bus service. And then we bus from Key West to Marathon, a bus service to bring workers from Marathon to Key West. We're losing our, our local families because of the cost. And just as a, as Mayor Broward County said, the, the minimum price of a house, families can't afford it. So they don't wanna live in an apartment the rest of their life either. So these are all issues that we have to deal with every day. And in addition- Mayor, Mayor, Gate, Mayor Gates, just think about that, what you just said about having to transport these workers and service workers to your communities. Just think about their lives and how they have to get up so early and they have to travel and they have to work and then yet the, there's I mean, no time for their families. I mean, so the stress amongst that alone uh, is, is just, you know, mind boggling to me. Yeah, it really yeah, is. That's a, that's a commute. It's, and it's yes. Essentially, it is a housing issue and a commute issue. Go ahead. Okay, one more comment on that. Those workers will not be long term because they not can't sustain that for a long period of time. They'll do it for a while and that makes it much more difficult for the employers because they're constantly having to turn over employees and training them. So it just snowballs and gets worse and worse. To, so we need to address it. The conversation continues. We take a quick break and turn our focus to something we all endure together every day. Traffic, the commute. What's in the works to make it better? We'll be right back. I don't think there's one person listening to us and having this conversation who hasn't very recently, possibly over the last week, sat in traffic and horrendous traffic. And I know um, each of the counties have a strategic plan and a long-term transportation plan. The fact is that South Florida is built on cars. And um, Daniela in Miami Day, there's been so much work and so much planning and we're watching it going up a double-decker highway and new bus fleet and in Broward, Brightline uh, train work to finesse some train stations there. Um, but South Florida is built on people who drive cars. And, and I wonder, Danielle, if you can kick us off into, is there any hope in 2023 that sitting in back of someone's taillights is gonna be an experience that goes away soon? Yes, I think the culture, the car culture will shift, is shifting if we have good alternatives. So we really have to kind of switch our mentality by creating good transit that is reliable, uh, affordable, gets you where you want to go. And uh, we have a very aggressive plan, of course, in Miami-Dade, which is now the SMART program uh, with the Aventura Brightline Station opening up. That's a piece of the puzzle. We have new express bus service on 836 going from the west. Uh, that is a, a game changer for people who need to get from uh, way west to downtown. Uh, the South Dade Transit Way bus rapid transit stations are under construction. Every Everybody can see it and it's building uh, hope and bringing smiles to commuters uh, all, all around. Uh, and uh, the North Corridor, we finally see a path to get federal dollars for extension of Metro Rail North and that would go to Hard Rock and beyond. It's an inter-county uh, opportunity and we are in conversations as well with Broward. And finally Miami Beach, which has been very elusive, the so-called Bay Link and um, we are pulling back uh, a procurement and redoing with the expectation we can have a one seat ride on the Metro Mover, which is the downtown loop. Uh, we're, I'm very excited. We, we have a great new transportation director who really knows transit. We've been able to reassess some of the, the plans from before. And uh, you know, these things don't happen quickly, but they are happening. And the devil is absolutely in the details. And all right, so I'm, I'm in Miami-Dade and I get on a, a train and um, <laughs> Mayor Craig Cates is coming up from Monroe and he gets on a train somewhere in South Dade and he takes it up to Broward and gets where he wants to go. Um, hmm. Maybe he gets on a bus and gets halfway to his destination. It is, is the real issue in that how do you get people to where they're going? 
not in a general sense from north, south, or east, or west, but we have no subway where I can get out at a stop and walk a block and, and be where we are, we're supposed to be. So oh. is that is that the challenge? I just want to say a last mile. We have these um, circulators and other things that are proving very popular. It's actually the area of transit that is growing most rapidly. These little freebies that are in um, uh, some of the, sm the smaller uh, cities along the transit routes, uh, Cutler Bay, Palmetto Bay, uh, Pinecrest. Aventura okay. has a freebie, I've seen that, yeah. <laughs> And people are using it to do routine trips around town, but also to connect to transit corridors. And, and I think, too, Glenna, I think one piece that, uh, and, and Miami-Dade's been so aggressive, too, and completed an agreement that our East Coastal Link is going to be coming on Broward County, which will, in Aventura will pick up in Broward and move all the way to the Palm Beach County line on the East Railroad, the FEC. That's going to be a game changer in our plans uh, as we work forward and towards uh, with FDOT and ultimately uh, get across the New River. But I think that transportation component will help and the CERT tax that we passed in 2018 will help fund that. But it's, it's going to be 2025, 2026, I think it is, is when it's going to be completed. But I think that's going to get folks out of the cars too. And I think what Mayor Lee Ming Cabas said, the mentality I think is changing. Uh, with our millennials and so forth that are going to want to live uh, near the transit stations that are going to be provided by the East Coast opportunity for the Coastal Link. And I think that's going to get them out of their cars uh, and maybe not even have to even purchase a car with the insurance and so forth. And the last mile opportunity that you have within our stations is going to be uh, helpful as well for those. And even at night, of course, the folks can entertain and they can use that last mile transportation opportunities to get them out of the cars and being able to participate in our businesses and in our restaurants. So this will be really interesting because we'll check back at the end of 2023 and see how many people really took that leap and got out of the car and started using all of these opportunities to sort of rethink transit. You know, um, I wanted to bring up something a little more newsy and of the moment, um, and especially Craig Cates in Monroe County, we've been seeing such a, sh a surge in migrant landings, and especially a couple of weeks ago um, in Title 42, the public health reason for barring migrants for entry was, it, it's still in place, but there was a day where there was a court decision coming where it might not have been and you saw that there was um, a real crowd surge of migrants trying to get in. South Florida is and has always been ground zero for those fleeing for whatever reason. And I wonder, Craig, if you can start us off and, and sort of address what is a federal issue, but certainly a county issue, because the, in the humanitarian sense, absorbing, caring for housing um, and, and providing infrastructure and process for migrants. How, how is that happening in the Keys? Yes, that's a, a huge burden on Monroe County and all our law enforcement agency, FWC, the Coast Guard, uh, Customs Border Protection, the migrants that, uh, coming in by boat have uh, increased unbelievably and uh, they to some weeks it was like 400 in one week they had down there it was unbelievable but that being said and it's a dangerous crossing it isn't like they can uh, you know they're walking and they're safe the weather gets bad they're out in these uh, small boats that aren't barely even seaworthy so there's been accidents that they've lost uh, uh, some of the refugees, the migrants, uh, they've drowned, so then they, that has to be addressed by the local governments. And then when they reach shore, then we have to take care of them. And also the boats that are coming ashore, washing ashore, uh, damaging the seabeds. Now uh, there's a process in the state of Florida to remove them, takes quite a while. Well, they looks like they're gonna be able to wave back because they can't really identify any owners and they're gonna start removing them next week and uh, there's a million dollars funding from the state to start removing it because we work so hard to protect the reefs and then they're being damaged by these boats but the people are trying to come over here and have a better life so i'm curious we all are down here how uh title 42 uh being removed what is going to happen with the cuban refugees trying to come across for a better life daniela lamar you want to add to that 
Well, we certainly are watching this um, with great concern. We've had numerous meetings with the White House, with Customs and Border Patrol, with Immigration Services, um, et cetera. We, we know that we are the place that many of these immigrants want to be. They have family and cultural connections. So we've been able to absorb with the help of our nonprofit community, uh, but we recognize that this is potentially something that could inundate us. Uh, so like other places around the country, we are preparing. And I'm guessing uh, Broward has, um, just as being part well. of the South Florida megalopolis. Uh, if similar. I could just add, Glenna, I'm, I'm reflecting that in my administration, now two years old, we've created new offices to deal with these emerging issues. So we have the first Office of New Americans that's very actively engaged in our immigration issues. We have an Office of Housing Advocacy to help people navigate the new programs and also eviction prevention, which we've been uh, very, very diligent in preventing um, tens of thousands of evictions. So as challenges emerge, uh, and of course we have aggressive economic development plans, et cetera, as do the other uh, counties. So we are a region. We just finished our climate compact meeting for the region. We work as one to deal with the issues of climate and sea level rise, uh, as was mentioned by uh, Mayor Case, uh, because we really are all in it together. We, we truly are uh, at the end of the day and, and also those who come to this country, you know, and land on our, our shores, you know, they are human beings. And so we need to do what we can to to help them in any way, shape or form. So um, as we work collectively together as mayors through our, our counties, um, I know we are conscious of that. We want to make sure that we can help them in any way possible. 100%. I'd like to just make one comment on that. Uh, uh, the ones, uh, Cubans, uh, refugees that are coming in, uh, there are a lot of Haitians also coming, but most of them all want to go to Miami. They have a lot of family there. And also that, I know, they're coming into Keys, and we have to address that, but they do want to go to Miami in that area where they have family and friends. Uh, so that uh, all the ones that are coming in down here end up up there in, in Bade and Broward County, so it affects them too. Yes, well, another quick break, and when we come back, some New Year's predictions we can take into 23. Stay tuned. I want to, in the short time we have left, um, just a, a little bit of fun. You know, we're all about spreading the love here. So take, um, you know, 20, 30 seconds and give us sort of the crystal ball, one prediction for 2023. Madam Mayor. It's, it's, you're, the only, you're the only woman, so <laughs> Madam Mayor would be you. <laughs> I am very excited that we are going to truly be able to create the pipeline for great jobs with the new companies coming and expanding. So we're focused squarely on pipeline to those jobs. And my prediction is that we are going to really succeed in getting more of our local people on board and that the rising tide here will truly raise all boats. Lamar Fisher. I certainly think the mayor is spot on, but I think also when you deal with jobs, you know, we have now the uh, Allen B. LeVan NSU Innovation Center that's going to incubate businesses to obviously work with corporate other entities to create those jobs. And I think what our focus is now is, is growing our small businesses, being able to create those jobs and obviously opportunities for South Florida to continue to grow. Whether we have a little dip, I'm not sure about that as far as the economy but I think we will continue to thrive. And so we look forward to, to making uh, the job creation and making our folks to, to get to work and to be able to afford hopefully uh, housing opportunities. Was that a prediction? <laughs> That's my prediction. I'll take that as a prediction. Craig Cates, Monroe Mayor, predict me something. Well, I'm predicting that we will uh, uh, win with these issues that we're having. I think uh, we had the climate summit, and I've been going to there for 13 years. What I said uh, was the most exciting part about it was that the private sector is getting involved now, having solutions to address these issues. The governments can't fix all this. We need to work closely with the private sector, just like the other mayors have been saying they have. So I think when we start working together, we're going to be able to address all these issues and come out the other side much better. 
Well, I think for, for everyone listening, we all have to love the optimism as we launch into this year. Happiest of New Year's to you all. I'm so thrilled that you were able to join us. And open invitation. I mean, uh, I know Craig Cates, this was your first time. I hope, I yes. hope you had some fun with us. And, I sure um, did. Thank you for having me. Of course. And uh, we will have all the mayors back, hopefully lots of times during 2023. Thank you so much. Look forward to it. All the best. Thank you. And up next, the year begins with an intense focus on South Florida schools. And Broward's district has more than its share. The superintendent, her future still uncertain. She's with us when we come back. Madam Superintendent, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you as well. Thank you. Great to have you today. Um, so what we want to do is kind of take a look at what to expect for the next year for Broward Schools. You know, you are in a very interesting position in that you actually have a job review coming up in, what, three weeks, 24 days. And yet here you are leading the district full steam ahead with a full plate of, of tasks to do, really. So kind of set the plate for us. Where are you in meeting certain benchmarks that have been given to you to meet, as well as planning for students um, in 2023? Certainly. So I think the very first thing is, is that we do have our district strategic plan and that does drive the work and the energy of the district. Um, and of course, it's, it's very specifically designed um, around an approach called student outcomes. Uh, and that is where we're really making sure that we are monitoring our students and all the work that we are doing is setting our students up for success. And so that, of course, goes alongside with my guiding principle of students first and so that is where a lot of our energy is focused right now. Um, with the 24 days, as you're talking about, um, that is an update. So it's an update to the board as to movement we have made um, related to some items that they wanted us to make sure that we addressed. It sounds like, I mean, anybody who is has been following a, a really tumultuous end of year for the Broward District, it, it sounds like what may be perceived um, or reality as past uh, inertia, bureaucracy, uh, do things the way we've always done it, which was a real issue with the board, both outgoing and incoming. It sounds like that is a real priority to get through the bureaucracy, to speed up the processes and really make it happen. That is exactly the case. You know, we, we're very fortunate in the, there are several areas uh, that this district does a wonderful job in, and we have so many wonderful things happening. Um, so even on our communication strategy, in order to get that type of information out into our community, uh, because I go to schools, I see programs that, frankly, I wouldn't see in other school districts, and I'm like going, we have to make sure our public knows about this, about these opportunities for our students and how we are setting them up for success. Uh, so that's something that we're doing right now as well. Uh, for example, with our Smart Bond program, a lot of people don't know that we, right now, we have over 200 construction projects actively in, in progress right now. And uh, when people don't know that type of information and uh, that there has been a change um, and that we have put in a different processes in order to make sure that there is a sense of urgency um, to go forward, uh, we've got to make sure that we're, we're communicating that out to our, our general community. I want to sort of shift back to the classroom. I think one of the things that as we come into 2023, one of the biggest focuses on the changes in education statewide, of course, are the new laws that are now in effect, actually. Um, and we talk about those all the time because it is such a seismic change for so many people, the laws like the parents' rights and education law. And specifically in that one, I, I want to talk a little bit about how, practically speaking, the district is going to be handling parents' rights and education is kind of a no-brainer anyway. But this new law is very specific about ways parents can challenge things like curriculum and books, as is already happening. And, it, and it's sort of taken on, no secret, a bit of a political atmosphere. So I, I'd like for you to talk about how the district will be setting that process in place for parents, all parents, to really get involved, uh, make challenges, and, and handle those challenges. 
You know, I, I'm going to be very frank with you. We welcome parents being involved in their child's education. And I look forward to that um, and to strengthening those partnerships uh, because it is a partnership. And it's one where we want to ensure that we are providing a, an appropriate uh, education that is going to ensure student success in the future. And so that partnership, again, as we have conversations, is something that we welcome. And I look I, I, I do enjoy now and look forward to continuing. Uh, whenever there is a concern by a parent, we hope that they will reach out, of course, um, to their school first. And because that's really the closest um, to where that concern may lie so that that conversation can occur with the school administrator um, and the parent, um, hopefully before you can go into the administrator, maybe the, the, the teacher and the parent are having the conversation first. Uh, and then from there, are we teachers prepared are, are teachers prepared for that. Is there have they been sort of briefed or trained or taken through how to handle those kind of interactions? So, uh, and I'm talking about more of your day-to-day -day, um, type of communications um, that are happening in, in, the, in the classroom. If there is a concern, again, what we would want is for it to be addressed at the school level first. Uh, there is a process in place, uh, so that way it, it gets documented. Um, we do have a review process as well in order to address the concern. Um, if it looks as though the, school, um, the parent is still not uh, satisfied uh, with the response from the school, uh, then we also, of course, we have it um, coming up to the district level next um, for us to go through, uh, a, again, a, a, another process to review these things um, in order to try to remedy the concern. So it, in, um, in not such a unrelated component, the State Department of Education uh, within the last couple of weeks have really reached out to a dozen or so school districts, Broward being one of them, and Miami-Dade as well, concerned about how some of the policies and processes, especially where it comes to LGBTQ students, comport with this new law. And I think I read someplace that Broward's district is now taking out a, a handbook of sorts that guides how to address LGBTQ issues. Um, so describe what's being taken away and in return, what is being put back in so that state law is complied with and yet the student population is safe and secure and welcome. You know, um, again, very good question. When we're working with students from the LGBTQIA plus community, uh, you, that is something that we take very seriously uh, because we do want to ensure that we are providing an inclusive environment uh, to where those students feel safe and secure. Unfortunately, we know that the suicide ideation um, or as well as suicide rate for uh, individuals from that community, unfortunately, is very high and uh, is very alarming. So ensuring that we have the proper supports in place that is going to be compliant with the law is very important. Our previous guide- hey, Do you have what that, what, what does that look like, practically speaking? And you may not have that yet. I'm just- that's that's right. Right. Yeah, so I want viewers to be able to get a sense of, practically speaking, how, how you're going to do that. So at this point in time, we are reviewing um, the guide that we were actually drafting this past summer. Now that we have the guidance from the state that was approved um, here at the end of October, we are going back and we're going to make sure that the guidance that supports our students and is following the law, uh, that we put that together and make available um, back out to our schools, um, to our students, to our parents. And again, the, the, the key thing on this is ensuring that we are in compliance with the law, uh, but also with the understanding that is critical for us to support our children, our students, our young adults, our staff members um, who are in the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, and knowing that we're here to support them uh, while complying with the law uh, and providing an atmosphere that is safe and secure for them. Quick pause here for a quick break and our conversation picks up with a look forward from the look back at overcoming learning gaps created by the pandemic.
We are, all of us everywhere, still coming off of the effects of COVID. And for students everywhere and teachers and school communities, that has been something to really deal with, um, with so many future implications. So we had talked about the, um, the component of how students are doing. I think we mentioned third grade English students, only slightly half of those third graders are deemed proficient by standards in English. So talk if you would, um, Ms. Superintendent, about the kinds of curriculum challenges and components that you've put in place to really get, get that COVID lag up to speed. Is that possible? So one of the things we have done here in Broward County Public Schools is really taken a look at our teaching pedagogy. Um, and what do I mean by that is uh, what is the teacher teaching and how are they teaching it? And what is that relationship and the interaction that occurs between the teacher and the student? And we really are lasering in on what we call standards-based instruction. What that means is here is your curriculum, the written curriculum that comes from the Department of Education. Based on this, it has a standard and it's supposed to be teaching whatever is in that standard. So that when we're saying standards-based instruction, that's what we're talking about, is that we're teaching to what is written in the curriculum. So the written curriculum is the taught curriculum and is the assessed curriculum. Uh, doing that is making sure that we work on our professional development um, that happens um, daily out at our schools uh, with our teachers um, because our school leaders are out there ensuring that they provide the appropriate support um, for their teachers in the classroom. Um, and this is coaching. Uh, it's not only the, the principal and the system principal, but we also have coaches. Uh, so for some of our sites, we'll have like a, a reading coach, we'll have a math coach uh, going in and really focusing in on how to work with the student a lot of times, but they also transfer skills over to that teacher. So that way, when that coach is not working with the student, the teacher is empowered um, to be able to help that student be successful. And is that specifically because of COVID or is this something that the district is just putting in place to advance learning? This is something we are putting into place to advance learning. I want to be very careful in saying that prior to COVID, um, COVID, the standards-based instruction is something that is is something we've done for years. The difference on this is that we're really fine-tuned into it, and, and we are ensuring that we work with our principals um, through their through the principal supervisors uh, to know that what are you looking for when you do a classroom observation or a walk. -through through or you know, when you're just walking into a classroom and, and seeing how things are going and, and walking out so that we know that the right support is being provided to our teachers. And that's really important. Uh, that goes back to the whole reason why I restructured our organization um, and back into the regional offices is to be closer to the teachers and closer to our schools, um, closer to our principals, to provide them real-time uh, assistance because our role is to serve the schools uh, and to ensure that they are being successful. Because if they are being successful, then we know that our children are being successful. And that is, again, going back to that guiding principle, students first. Is, is there a teacher shortage issue this year? Uh, there's always a teacher shortage issue across the entire nation. There is one right now. Um, we started off the year really strong. Um, I'll be very frank. What we did is, in fact, this is something I'm, I'm very proud of because it, the work of my HR team, um, the work of our school principals and others really laser focused on this. We started the school year off in every one of our core academic classes with a, a teacher in those classes. Um, now, some of those teachers may have been district-based um, teachers that were temporarily were placed out into schools to ensure that we started the year off right away. Uh, we still are having people from district office go in uh, when there are vacancies, uh, but we do have a lot of mobility with our teachers. Uh, you know, it may be that, uh, you know, the significant other uh, has a job offer and 
New York <laughs> so has left and you know it has to move uh, or we also have yeah. retirements that occur during the year uh, so this is always something that we're constantly it's a moving target and we're constantly going out recruiting best serve our students is having that being supportive right and um, when you're having conversations with youths uh, looking at it through the lens of a glass half full uh, rather than a glass half empty, and having those meaningful engagements. So over in our schools, uh, some of the things that we will be starting to work on is something uh, that's a whole campaign that we're going to start with. Um, so curbside appeal. And let me explain what that is real fast. So curbside appeal basically like for is selling a house. Curbside <laughs> <laughs> appeal for selling a house. <laughs> well, the curbside appeal is really important uh, because we know the wonderful things that are happening inside of our facilities and with our students because, boy, we just have such a wonderful supportive staff and they are working as hard as they can and our students are reaping those benefits. But sometimes when you drive by a school and you look at it from the outside, you're like, oh, I'm not really sure I would want to send my children there. And our students sometimes were like, okay, yeah, that's the school I go to. And they don't have that sense of pride uh, that they should have, right? And so we're really working to formulate a ways in which um, individual schools uh, working with our partners in education, also our community members um, getting involved uh, in order to do beautification. Well, volunteering is... You're talking about volunteering? Yes, yes, volunteering your time. Um, yeah, and of course, we always look for volunteers to be mentors inside of our schools too, but not everybody's comfortable doing that. And we can appreciate that. Um, or volunteering in the classroom, helping a teacher out. Uh, so there are so many different ways uh, that individuals can work alongside us as we support our next generation coming forward, our students. Well, I uh, so appreciate you being with us on this New Year's Day. Happy New Year, New Year to you and yours. And, uh, you know, we will be in touch with you, as you know, throughout the year, um, watching all the things that you do. And uh, we invite you back anytime. Appreciate it so much. And Happy New Year's to you and to all of the viewers. And we will be right back. Make it so easy to rewatch any of today's interviews and conversations and also listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast. Grab your phone, scan this QR code, and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. And as you know, we are there online 24-7 all year long. Thank you so much for kicking off 2023 with us. We've got some great things in store. We hope you'll be with us. Happy New Year from the entire team here at This Week in South Florida.